Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about the rumors about an RX 6600 and 6600 XT that popped up on forums online. We'll also be going over Sony's PS5 sales, kind of insane, and expectations on supply of the PS5, and the CPU market share research getting further detailed by Mercury Research and others in the past week. We'll be going over some of that. It's been some growth and some regression in different markets, depending on what you're looking at for AMD. Uh, we'll also be going over Samsung's CXL-based DDR5 modules. So this is pretty interesting stuff you'll want to learn about. And uh, also, we'll be talking about Der Bauer. Before that, this video is brought to you by Keoxia, said to be the original inventors of NAND flash memory and formerly known as Toshiba memory. Keoxia's XG6 M.2 SSD is a high-end NVMe SSD claiming up to 3180 megabytes per second read and 2960 megabytes per second write speed sequentially, and it's ideally used in high-performance gaming PCs or power-conscious laptops. The XG6 is available up to one terabyte, and the company also has its BG4 SSD in a much smaller M.2 2230 form factor for up to one terabyte of ultra compact storage. Learn more about Keoxia at the links in the description below, including about their enterprise storage products. So first up, a really exciting announcement on the GN side of things. We have some new mouse pads on the store on store.gamersnexus.net. There is a full announcement video on the channel if you want to check that out. But I was planning to give you some behind the scenes for the new mouse pad development for the ones that we have. They're really cool, really happy about it. And it's sort of a response to some requests from our community to make these. So specifically, when we launched the mouse mat, also on store.gamersnexus.net. We saw a lot of excitement over them. It's been probably our best-selling product in terms of units moved right up there with the mod mat. But there were a good amount of requests for a red one. And we actually had just started working on this behind the scenes. This has been in development for uh, probably about eight to 10 months at this point. And that's because we were working on getting some really cool features added to it, like the red rubber underside. We have the blue rubber underside that we debuted on the mouse mat for the full desk size surface. And we now added that to this red and black mat. So the custom color rubber underside on the uh, mouse pads and mouse mats we do, it does cost actually a good deal more in terms of percentage. We don't pass that on to you though, because we've been able to move the quantities up enough at this point where we can just soak the cost. And I think this at this point is the best quality mouse pad you can get at the price point. So we're selling them at $20, there's two versions. They have a custom color stitching along the edges to help with preventing fraying so that it'll last a long time. Our goal is always something that'll last a really long time and we're following through with that here. Uh, and then they have the custom color underside as well and the designs are just really cool. So Andrew worked on this one for quite a while. We did a lot of tweaking on this because the perspective is a little bit interesting. It was all made in Blender in 3D and tweaked the perspective around until we got this which is a GPU component layout design. So you can actually see some of the screw holes, for example, through the PCB, the, the quote unquote PCB. In the design, you can see the inductors, the MOSFETs, capacitors, the GPU itself on top of the substrate. And Andrew even did the MLCCs that are on the substrate. So crazy level of detail on that. We're really proud of it. The print quality is also very good. This, this factory we've been working with We've been working with them on investing more and more into the printing technology and getting up to a higher resolution print every single time, and uh, it looks sharp. And then the other design is a black and blue, and it's more of a almost block diagram of a motherboard. So you can see that we've got a, well, maybe a little bit of a, an AIM4 <laughs> inspired socket there in the middle, uh, inductors around the edges, PCIe slot, two RAM slots. So you can basically think of it almost like a mini ITX board layout design if you want to stick with the black and blue theme. Of course, we do have this one freshly restocked. It's been uh, on our store for a while now, really popular, and that's up there as well. So I just really wanted to talk about that. I genuinely appreciate those of you who uh, sit through these announcements in the news videos and, and let me talk about it, because it's exciting for us. This, at this point, is what basically funds our operation. Uh, I feel like my whole life at this point is made out of mod mats and mouse mats, but it's what lets us invest more and more into our testing. So for example, Patrick Stone now has been working on the Gigabyte power supply testing, and it's really cool content. Uh, we've never done anything quite like it for probably about three to four weeks at this point. We could have never afforded that before. That's, that is not a money-making endeavor from an advertising standpoint. You just, you can't make return on that, at our size at least. And the reason we can actually invest the time to try and figure out a really strange behavior in a product we don't normally test, like a power supply, is specifically because of the store.gamersnexus.net support we get 
from those of you who want something in return for supporting us. So thank you for letting me talk about it. And, uh, and thank you for funding our added depth to the testing and coverage we've been doing. Really excited about that, especially the work that the Patricks have been doing lately because they've had more time budget to invest into each piece because the cost, obviously their time, is more or less funded by the store at this point and Patreon. Uh, so thanks to everyone who, who contributes in that way. Just as a thank you for those of you who buy our new stuff when it releases and support us, I'm going to sign 50 of each of these new mouse pads and they will be distributed at random uh, for the first couple of days of launch. So this dates back to when they actually came out uh, all the way through the next couple of days. We're just going to mix them in randomly. There's a chance you might get one. Obviously, buy it mostly because you want the mouse pad. But hey, you might get lucky and get a signature. So that's on the store. The red and black one, I think, is probably going to be the most popular. But I'm looking forward to seeing what is. Because we've never done a largely red-themed product. This is the first one. So if you've been asking for red, <laughs> then I, I hope this is what you're looking for. This is the first time we've done something off the blue and black theme. I really like how it looks, but we're going to be doing more with this color theme, I'm sure, if it, if it goes over well. Uh, mouse mats are on the way. They're arriving in June. If you want a back order, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and place a back order for those, and it'll ship out as soon as it's in. But otherwise, full details on this stuff on the store pages and in the announcement video. Thank you for letting me talk about it, and thank you for supporting our increased efforts in testing. OK, let's get to the actual hardware news now. So the first one is a rumor. And this is about AMD's RX 6600 XT and 6600, or we should say alleged of those two. It's like distributive math. You put alleged in front of the parentheses and then distribute it across all of the alleged and rumored items. Uh, so this one firmly is under rumors category, but the Chip Hell forums recently had a GPU-Z screenshot uploaded by one of the users showing the RX 6600 series GPUs. So in reading the Chip Hell forum post, we were able to determine a couple of things. The forum post is all in Chinese. Uh, but it basically says that the samples are from Sapphire, they're engineering samples, and that modified drivers were required to get them working. And also the post notes that an accurate frequency reading was unable to be obtained at this point for the 6600, alleged 6600 series GPUs. They did, however, note via screenshot that uh, there's 8 gigabytes of memory running GDDR6 for both of those and that's shown with GPU-Z, and also shows a 128-bit bus width with a shader count of 1792. Uh, appears to also still be 7 nanometers, but at this point, that's not really a surprise for AMD hardware. So that's what we know right now. Uh, the user was careful to note that certain items were not able to be ascertained, again, like frequency, or we don't know the, the full accuracy of some of the information. They also noted that PCIe Gen 4 was functioning and that rebar support a resizable bar, also known as smart access memory via AMD's terminology, is available and working. One other postulation in the forum thread was the potential for applying a 6600 XTV BIOS to the 6600 non-XT. This is something that you've kind of been able to do on AMD GPUs for a really long time. Some of you probably remember from over a decade ago when it was the, the hot thing to try and flash like HD 7000 series or HD not even older, I think 4000 series, cards to a higher bin. Uh, anyway, that was in the discussion thread. That's all we have on it for now, and we'll be following up as soon as we have more. Quick one on NVIDIA while we're at it. So we have heard through rumblings in the industry, nothing official from NVIDIA, but from NVIDIA's partners that there's a launch timing for the 3080 Ti and a 3070 Ti roughly around the same time, if not the exact same time, happening within the next three to four weeks. That should be around end of May, beginning of June, somewhere in that timeline. And uh, at this point, we haven't heard anything official from NVIDIA, but probably that communication will go out soon. Up next, AMD CPU market share for first quarter 2021. We talked about this a little bit in the previous one, uh, especially with the Steam hardware survey. But this report is done by Mercury Research. It has a market share report. And the report shows that AMD has notched some significant growth in some markets over the last, well, Actually, they've had the best server CPU growth in 15 years recently. Uh, however, while AMD is snatching up market share in some segments, like in server and actually among Steam users as well, there's been a bit of an overall market share shrink when considering the full picture, especially with laptops in the mix. For the server market, AMD moved up to 8.9%, marking a 1.8 percentage point increase quarter over quarter and a 3.8 percentage point increase year over year. For server chips, this is AMD's highest single quarter increase 
in share since 2006, which, if you don't remember, was the peak of AMD's Opteron heyday. These numbers coincide with AMD's last earnings report, where AMD managed to double its data center revenue. Quote, while we don't often discuss average selling prices, we know that this quarter saw unusually strong price moves for AMD, as AMD shipped fewer low-end parts and more high-end parts, as well as shipping many more server parts. The company's average selling price increased significantly. This was by Dean McCarran from Mercury Research. The ASP change or the average selling price change is really not a surprise to anyone who pays attention to this market, not just an enthusiast, but everywhere. But if we look at the enthusiast DIY market, there's nothing in the $200 to $300 price range, really. There's 5,600Xs, sort of, uh, in terms of retail user pricing, not a wholesale to the customer, like retailers. But there's nothing cheap right now for desktop CPUs, and the prices have crept up a little bit as AMD has become more competitive with Intel. So this is not a surprise to see an ASP increase. AMD actually did seed a bit of market share back to Intel, though, in notebooks and overall x86 market share. AMD fell down by one percentage point in notebook market share to land at a flat 18%. Meanwhile, AMD's desktop market share moved to 19.3% after losing a bit of share to Intel last quarter. AMD also lost one percentage point in overall x86 market share, moving down to 20.7%. As for why these losses are happening when they are happening for AMD, it's pretty simple. It's supply. Intel, for as much as it's been mocked over the years for its obsession with the number 14 and the plus sign, has been able to maintain decent supply. And that's because Intel, unlike basically everyone else in the desktop space, owns its supply chain, at least the fabs. And uh, Intel has been diversifying. They're starting to work with TSMC, potentially with other fabs. They're doing their own foundry service, where they're using their fabs as a service for other partners like Sci-5. Uh, but Intel still owns the fabs, and that gives it an advantage where AMD is a customer to TSMC. If TSMC is tapped out on seven nanometers, there's not a whole lot that AMD can do other than start talking to global foundries, which by the way, they're doing, uh, to renew wafer agreements for different process nodes and different technologies. And they are doing that, by the way. So Intel has a really interesting advantage where right now it's got actually some pretty competitive parts. We've talked about that recently. but. Up until recently, AMD was in a, a commanding position in a lot of the DIY market. Uh, however, that position is sort of irrelevant if you can't actually supply the market more than your competitor is able to supply the market. So that's AMD's weak point right now, but it is one that AMD has been working on. Both AMD and Intel shipped a record number of CPUs last quarter. AMD is especially dealing with high demand, seemingly selling every single piece of silicate it can produce at this point. And the market overall for PC sales has grown significantly. It's at one of the highest points it's ever been at. Certainly the highest point in terms of sales volume for computer parts and pre-built computers in the last 10 years of my history working in this industry. Uh, and beyond that, I, I can't tell you what the numbers were. So it's not a matter of the products don't exist. It genuinely is a matter of there's not enough products to meet the demand, which is like everything else, obscene. Saw a story that said people were panic buying houses as well. So, you know, that's where we are. But uh, the industry's growing. It's just a matter of being able to sustain that growth seems impossible given that they can't meet the demand. But that's a story you all know at this point very well. Uh, unfortunately, through firsthand experience, it's, it's been tough for people to get the parts they want. Okay, Sony expects tight supply, speaking of, on the PlayStation 5 through 2022. Sony is not anticipating its PlayStation 5 supply to improve anytime soon, and that's following comments made by Sony's CFO, Hiroki Totoki. Sony's recent earnings report highlighted that Sony has sold 7.8 million PS5 consoles through March 31st, 2021, and it's aiming to sell 14.8 million units through the current fiscal year. However, Sony again admits that it is struggling to keep up with demand. Quote, I don't think the demand is calming down this year, and even if we secure a lot more devices and produce many more units of the PlayStation 5 next year, our supply wouldn't be able to catch up with demand, said Totoki. For reference, Sony notched 14.8 million PlayStation 4 consoles sold during the console's first fiscal year, although Sony wasn't facing a global semiconductor shortage back then either. Todoki also stated that Sony will need to ramp production on the PS5 as it doesn't expect demand to curtail once the pandemic is less present. Quote, we have sold more than 100 million units of the PlayStation 4, and considering our market share and reputation, I can't imagine demand dropping easily, Sony said in its statement. 
Up next, Samsung claims it can scale into one terabyte class DDR5 territory with DRAM capacity. Samsung noted that this should be possible by uh, taking the wraps off of its first CXL-based DDR5 module, actually, as far as we're aware, the industry's first CXL-based DDR5 module. Samsung was intentionally tight on the details, but being based on CXL memory protocol that uses a PCIe 5 by 16 connection, a theoretical 32 giga transfers per second of bandwidth is possible. The idea, it seems, is to allow for increasing memory akin to the way storage is increased. With the advent of the CXL fabric, servers are able to supplement socketed DRAM with the addition of massive pools of memory that can be shared between the CPU and the GPU via the PCIe interface. Samsung notes that it has already tested and validated its CXL DDR5 module with next-gen servers based on Intel platforms. Those would be Sapphire Rapids and Eagle Stream, by the way. Intel, for its part, will support CXL 1.1 over the PCIe Gen 5 a solution with Sapphire Rapids, and this will also mark the introduction of PCIe Gen 5 support from Intel. Servers based on Intel Sapphire Rapids are expected towards the end of this year, and Samsung quotes AMD in its press release, though AMD isn't expected to adopt DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5 until 2022. As a reminder, AMD joined the CXL consortium back in 2019. Up next, Fizon, the SSD controller manufacturer, is expecting a controller shortage and SSD price increases. This is according to Digitimes, a report showing that Fizon joining now a growing chorus of storage vendors predicting a rise in the SSD market pricing. This is something that Adata and Team Group have commented on recently as well. For them, though, it was specifically with relation to Chia, whatever, farming, mining. Uh, additionally, Fizon seems to expect SSD controller shortages to extend into 2022, possibly 23. Uh, the SSD market at this point is grappling with controller shortages in the form of Samsung's, which makes its own controllers. And uh, as Digitimes reports, Fizon's outlook business-wise is optimistic as the demand for storage continues to grow and so will prices. Fizon chairman KS Puak reportedly claimed that NAND flash prices will grow by 10% in quarter three of 21, driven by high demand, and also Chia, whatever, and supply constraints. Up next, some moves by semiconductor manufacturers that are in the sort of political sphere or politically adjacent sphere. This has been a big talking point the last several months now, but uh, there's been a lot of talk about bringing more fabrication facilities over to the US, Intel being really the only major dominant player here although there's a couple others as well, uh, and to Europe. So this one is specifically talking about the US. The, there's a new coalition uh, including Google, Intel, and Apple, and others, like TSMC is actually in there, even though it's an international company. And so is Samsung and ASML, which is a supplier of TSMC. They make the things that make the things. Uh, so this is the Semiconductors in America Coalition. It's called SIAC. It announced its formation in a press release this past week, and it's made up of companies that are aiming to lobby the U.S. government for subsidies for U.S.-based semiconductor manufacturing. In its initial press release, SIAC stated that, quote, SIAC's, we're going to call it SIAC, SIAC's mission is to advance federal policies that promote semiconductor manufacturing and research in the U.S. to strengthen the U.S.'s economy, national security, and critical infrastructure. It looks like initially SIAC will focus on bolstering support for the current administration's CHIPS for America Act. The CHIPS Act was passed by the House and the Senate earlier this year as part of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 21. However, it has not yet been funded. SIAC is attempting to lobby support for that funding, and uh, uh, the White House has previously called for $50 billion in funding for the CHIPS Act, and SIAC also supports that level of funding because, of course, they would. It's $50 billion. Why wouldn't they support that? Uh, you know, record, record profit, record sales, can't meet demand, and uh, also we're, we're not going to scale up manufacturing until we figure out which government will give us the most money, but that's business today. Uh, so, surprise, Chia Mining can wreck cheaper SSDs. This in the news now. This is actually where Der Bauer comes into play. Uh, Der Bauer did a really cool video on his channel. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out, where he built an insane system storage-wise. I believe he said it was about a $5,000 system in terms of the components. And he tested Chia mining. He was very adamant that farming is kind of a, a BS nomenclature to try and take away focus from the fact that it's still functionally 
mining. It's still functionally proof of work in some form. And he did research on it, tested it, and was interested in the topics of uh, the destruction of the drives, the aging of the drives, and of the performance. And if, if uh, his video serves as any indication, Roman said that he made no money in the couple of weeks he was testing this. Roman did a really good job with the video. We'd recommend you check it out. If, if I were going to cover this topic, that's probably how I would have done it because he kind of challenges the fact that it has this front of appearing very uh, environmentally friendly as opposed to traditional GPU mining and proof of work, but in reality, it's not that much better. So check his video out if you haven't seen it. In relatively unsurprising news, Chia farming can be detrimental to lower cost SSDs or many consumer grade SSDs for that matter that aren't suited for the right intensive nature of Chia. It looks like creating Chia plots with SSDs and farming those plots with hard drives seems to be the popular approach, but many consumer SSDs lack the NAND endurance for extensive plot creation. I really feel like I'm talking about something like Terraria or Minecraft right now with this terminology, but this is a thing. It's These are the words that they chose. A report from my drivers points out that a cheap 512 gigabyte SSD can be wrecked in about 40 days as Chia workloads will completely consume the drive's write life. The my drivers report, even uh, roughly translated, didn't mention a TBW for the drive tested, but lower cost 512 gigabyte SSDs often have ratings between 250 and 300 TBW. Recently, Team Group announced its T-Create Expert SSD, the first SSD we know of that aimed uh, itself solely at Chia mining. And that particular SSD features an MTBF of 3 million hours and a TBW rating of up to 12,000 terabytes. Up next, Right to Repair has really been making waves lately. It's been in the news a lot. We talked previously about Lewis Rossman's initiative, Fight to Repair, and we've been covering that occasionally. Now there's an FTC report on Right to Repair that's been in the works since about 2019. It's finally come to fruition and they've published something on it. So the FTC in this report examines repair restrictions across several industries, but it takes particular issue with repair practices within the realm of smartphones and cars. After the FTC's 2019 workshop, the FTC compiled public comments, responses to a request for empirical research and data, and independent research. Manufacturers and companies have long hid behind flimsy excuses for constricting repairs, such as the need to protect IP, security issues, and even consumer safety. And these excuses have also long been refuted by repair advocates. But the FTC has finally acknowledged them as well. The FTC stated the following, quote, based on a review of comments submitted and materials presented during the workshop, there is scant evidence to support manufacturers' justifications for repair restrictions. Moreover, the specific changes that repair advocates seek to address manufacturer repair restrictions, e.g. the access to information, the manuals, the spare parts, and the tools, are well supported by comments submitted for the record and testimony provided at the workshop. Furthermore, the report from the FTC finds that manufacturers and OEMs constrict repair through a few primary avenues. We'll put those on the screen. The main ones are unavailability of parts and repair information, designs that make independent repairs less safe, and disparagement of non-OEM parts and independent repair. They also talk about software locks, firmware updates, and EULAs. Again, for those who have been paying attention the last few years, none of this is particularly surprising, but it is monumental for the FTC specifically to shine a spotlight on this issue. The FTC is reporting its findings to Congress, and it also, quote, stands ready to work with legislators either at the state or the federal level in order to ensure that customers have choices when they need to repair products that they purchase and own. Keyword there being own. Becoming more of a question every time you buy something now. Furthermore, the FTC is also looking to more adequately enforce the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, MMWA, which is a law that is often laughably ignored by companies who generously apply, quote, warranty void if removed stickers to their devices. We've talked about this a lot in the teardowns, often remarking that they are unenforceable at least where we live. And finally, a kind of interesting story out of Framework, which is a startup out of San Francisco that's looking to make a splash in consumer electronics, specifically in laptops, with a modular laptop design that's supposed to have more replaceable components. This is an attempt at stepping away from all of the adhesives, plastic clips, and other solutions that break as you take components. Not that we've ever talked about glue and electronics. We've never seen that, but they're trying to resolve some of that. Framework is a new company, it's a startup, and that means that there are going to be some risks associated, obviously, with buying a product from a company that is manufacturing the modules 
for long-term use. So it's a bit of a commitment. It's an interesting goal though. They're aiming for more sustainability than traditional laptops. And the modular approach is specifically targeting things like memory, storage, using so dims or drives rather than soldering it to a board, and also allowing users to change connectivity ports with Frameworks expansion cards. These cards allow users to change the types of port on the machine as well as what side they're on. Currently, Framework is offering expansions for USB-C, USB Type A, HDMI, and DisplayPort. The company also stated that it's currently developing future expansion cards for things like high-end audio amps and that it has opened up reference designs and schematics, which is pretty cool, so that partners and the community can improve and expand upon the system. Additionally, the entire motherboard can be swapped out as well, and that's in the event the users want to upgrade to a future processor or to a motherboard that supports more storage and memory. From what we've seen so far, there are three different options from Frameworks laptops. We might try and get one in to look at it at some point. Framework, if you're watching this, uh, reach out to us. We'll work on a review or something of your components. But they've got some pre-configured options and a, a more a la carte option if you want a semi-DIY approach. The pre-configured ones fall under base, performance, and professional categories. And as usual, the biggest differentiators are what you'd expect, processor and the memory option. Regardless of the configuration, Framework is currently relying on Intel's 11th gen Tiger Lake mobile CPUs. Specifically, these would be the, uh, the i7-11-8, 5G7 I was going to try and do it without referencing the script, but I had to. There's also the 1165G7 and the 1135G7. We used to know these kinds of CPUs as the Intel U series, but now they're known as UP3. Also unmemorable in terms of the naming. Framework is not currently offering discrete GPUs. It's instead relying on Intel's Iris XELP graphics. And Framework says that all the parts can be accessed and swapped with the included screwdriver and bits and that it's publishing repair and replacement guides that consumers can access. This is pretty cool. The Framework laptop starts at $1,000 for the base edition and $750 for the DIY edition. Pre-orders are open now with estimated shipping in July. We're going to try and buy one of these if we can, uh, depending on, on what their pre-orders look like. Otherwise, we'll reach out to Framework or they'll reach out to us and we'll work on some coverage of it as it comes to fruition. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up some of our new mouse pads. We have three of them that we've just restocked, two brand new ones discussed earlier, a restock of the classic black and blue with a sharper print than ever, and otherwise, patreon.com slash gamersnexus for bonus videos. Thank you for watching and for supporting, and we'll see you all next time.